Welcome to Sound Bites, hosted by registered dietitian nutritionist Melissa Joy Dobbins. Let's delve into the science, the psychology, and the strategies behind good food and nutrition. Hello, and welcome to the Sound Bites podcast. Today's episode is about the Mediterranean diet, what you thought you knew, and what you need to know about this very popular diet and lifestyle. My guest today is Pam Fullenweider. Pam is a registered dietitian nutritionist, a culinary nutritionist, and the founder of Fully Mediterranean, where she and her team teach people how to incorporate the Mediterranean diet into their lifestyle. Welcome to the show, Pam. Well, thank you so much, Melissa. I'm so happy to be here and to visit with you and your listeners about the Mediterranean diet. I'm so excited to dive right in. I want everybody listening to know that this episode is not sponsored. Pam, you have spent the better part of your career focusing on public health and cardiovascular health in particular. Right. And you have a very strong culinary background as well. I would love for you to share with our listeners more about your background, your education, perhaps how you got interested in this work and then the work that you do in particular, and also any disclosures to note. Sure. I do not have any disclosures okay. as of right now. And so, yes, I love what I do, first of all. And, you know, it's just a natural fit for me. So I've always loved to cook. I have always enjoyed meals with my family and friends. And it's always been a part of my family. My grandmother was from New Orleans, so it just mm. came very naturally. It's kind of what we did growing up. And then I pass it on to my own children. Then I really got interested in becoming a dietitian twofold because my mom was like the original of a lactation consultant with the Children's Nutrition Research Center in wow. Houston. And they were the first ones doing breast milk research. And so I got to meet Anita Owen, the president of the American Dietetic Association, oh what we gosh. used to call it back there. Really great. I was working there in the summer. And then I have a really strong family history of heart disease. And so that was so impactful because I saw what was happening in my family and what the doctors were recommending. We have this amazing Texas Medical Center where some of the founding really heart transplants and heart operations really all founded. So it's been so great to be in Houston. But that's all how it happened. And I just have always loved food and really started becoming more and more interested in it. And so I've been a registered dietitian for over 30 years. And, you know, I've done everything from clinical practice, which I love. Mm -hmm. I have a private practice still. I had a partner. So I've had different partners, um, a corporate consultant. And then I really started, even in the clinical setting, started working with chefs. And that's really what was super fun for me. I got to compete in a national cooking competition and we actually won. That's awesome. Super fun. And then I've worked with restaurants and then really in culinary education is where I've ended up more recently. And so, you know, I've seen a lot of different diets, right? Mm -hmm. As a dietitian practicing this long. And so we were low fat, no fat. And really, like you said, primarily I've always dealt with heart health. Really, that's really always been my focus. And, you know, we were eating eggs, then we're not eating eggs or we're eating them again. And so, you know, I felt like my patients and clients really made progress, but it wasn't sustainable. And, and then 2016, I really had the opportunity, I was so happy I had the opportunity to partner with UT Health School of Public Health with their Nourish program. And they're this amazing nutrition hub in the middle of the Texas Medical Center here in Houston. And what they do is they're food first and they're a seed to plate teaching model. They're part of the teaching collaborative kitchens. What they do is they teach culinary medicine to medical students, other health professionals. Hmm. And so I came in and so I ended up being the public portion to their program. What they do is they have this beautiful teaching garden demonstration kitchen. And then you get to teach while you're cooking and eating hmm. and enjoying meals with others. And so that's what we would have people come into the medical center to do. And it's really there that I witnessed firsthand the impact that the Mediterranean diet really had on people. But the Mediterranean diet was part of their curriculum, was what they were teaching. Mm -hmm. And so I saw that students, you know, the food tasted great mm -hmm. and was healthy. And, you know, when I asked students what they love about the class, we always do a survey and it was that the food tasted great. So it really, really helped people understand that good food and good health go together. And it's possible. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, I'd like to start off by teasing some of the common misconceptions about the Mediterranean diet. And as we go through our conversation, we can clear some of those up. So what are the most common misconceptions that you're hearing about the diet? Okay. So what we hear all the time is it's a vegetarian diet, right? Mm -hmm. That's one of the biggest. And then we see, well, uh, this is one of my favorites. I drink red wine, so I follow the Mediterranean diet. (laughs) Or it could be I eat salmon, which is all great. Um, You have to eat only Mediterranean foods. Another one is that it's expensive, Mm. and I understand that. And then it's really misconceptions about fat, that Mm. is fat going to make me fat? Um, Wait a second. I have heart disease. Aren't I supposed to be on fat-free or Mm. low-fat diet? So those are really the big misconceptions that we have. Okay, great. So let's talk about what exactly is the Mediterranean diet and lifestyle, because I know that's a big part of it. Yes. And what are the associated benefits? Sure. So the Mediterranean diet is this wonderful eating pattern and lifestyle based on countries bordering the Mediterranean Sea. And, you know, when you think about the Mediterranean, people assume it's Greece, Spain and Italy. And of course it is. But there's really more to the story. Mm -hmm. There's 21 countries bordering the Mediterranean Sea. We like to talk about the pillars of the Mediterranean diet. So let's go through those. Okay. So there's three. The first one is nutrition. And that's what you want to think about here, that it's primarily plant-based foods, but not exclusively. So, you know, you really have to help your clients understand what that means. So, you know, plants are at the center of your plate, but not exclusively. So there's still room for meat, just in smaller amounts. It's really all about quality food components, whole, unprocessed foods. The second pillar is exercise and movement. So we want you to include activities of daily living and exercise. So both of those are important. Exercise and physical activity should be a part of your lifestyle to maintain good health. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the third pillar is really what sets us apart from other eating patterns and lifestyles. We recommend enjoying meals with others. It's all about that social connectivity. You know, that offers so many health benefits. I think this one is so important and really often overlooked. You know, the Mediterranean has this wonderful perspective on eating. It's the emphasis on pleasure, of sharing meals with others. Meals are more than just about fuel. It's really about enjoying your food. And Taking the time to enjoy your meals, you know, it strengthens your social connectivity. And we can talk later about all the different benefits that come along with that. So what we do at Fully Mediterranean is we take this pattern of eating and apply it to any cuisine. My job is that we have to meet people where they are. We help them interpret this pattern into their own kitchen and their lives. And I always say, You know, we have to really think about it as dietitians because changing eating patterns is hard, right? Mm -hmm. So we try to make it as fun as possible. And for me, that fun is in the kitchen. So we have this culinary aspect to our programs because, listen, it is stressful. It is painful. Food is personal. And so we really want, again, to meet them where they are and really help them see the pleasure in all of this. Mm -hmm. When we talk about the associated benefits, This is where it's really so amazing because we know that people who follow the Mediterranean diet have a 30% reduction in death from all disease. I mean, you got to take that in a second. It's pretty amazing statistic. And the diet was discovered based on observations that people living in these Mediterranean countries had significantly lower incidences of heart disease and stroke. So we know that following the Mediterranean diet helps prevent heart disease. We know it's involved in the prevention and management of diabetes. It helps reduce your risk of certain cancers, colorectal, breast, stomach, and liver. It helps prevent Alzheimer's, dementia, and depression. And really, it helps people live longer. It's about longevity. Mm. You know, how we eat today is so influenced by misinformation and gimmicks and fad diets. And we know they don't work. And so I like people to think about the Mediterranean diet, you know, really think that it is all about sound science and it's not about the quick fix. It is all about long term sustainability. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Several things that you mentioned I wanted to touch on. Um, I love that it's exercise and movement. Yes. Because like you said, those daily activities. Yeah. Activities of daily living. Yes. The ADL. You know, things like 
vacuuming and yeah, you know, I don't know, uh, gardening. Yes, gardening, moving around. I mean, what you do is so important. And I think sometimes we forget we're not moving. <laughs> you know, we it depends on where you live. And listen, I live in a very hot climate. Houston has mm-hmm. been ridiculously hot this summer. And you're like, how am I going to get outside? How am I going to move in my house? You know, keep doing these things that we want to do. Right. Yeah. And then, of course, you have the exercise. And I would throw in there, too, as we age, you know, strength training. Right. We have to talk about that, too. Yeah, absolutely. But I love that because people, you know, we hear exercise all the time. And I do mm-hmm. think we forget about these activities of daily living. Yes. That, that really does help increase your movement. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then the social aspect and the enjoyment, of course. And I know I've heard this a lot with the family meals movement. Yes. Where there's a ton of research on the social aspect of our meals translating to significant health and mental health benefits. My gosh. I hadn't really thought of it with the Mediterranean diet. So I love that aspect as well. Absolutely. You also touched on one of the things I was going to talk with you about, and I think we can weave this through the rest of our conversation, is behavior change, diet, lifestyle is not easy. No. And putting that fun factor into it Mm -hmm. is genius. It's key. It's the game changer, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to talk more about the fun and the enjoyment. Like you said, food is personal. And to help somebody get from what they're currently doing towards the Mediterranean diet, I mean, that's everything that you do with your work and your program that you're going to tell us about. Yeah. I mean, that longevity, you know, the longevity is one thing, but it's the quality of life, too. It is. Absolutely. Yeah. And also, you know, the elephant in the room is, you know, this Mediterranean diet. I mean, you probably know all the stats. It's rated the number one diet. Yes. For decades. I don't know how long. U.S. News and Report. We've been rated top diet for the last six years, right? Okay. Easiest to follow. Best diet for diabetes. You know, tied with heart health. Really best plant-based, plant-forward diet. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, wow. What's so incredible is that there's this consensus from all different areas of our life for not only researchers, doctors, and then health professionals have rated it that high, right? So it's from all different areas, which is very rare. Right. And despite that consensus, which is very compelling. Yes. It's sort of like, I don't want to say boring, but compared to these gimmicks and yeah. and all these things that people are hearing. Right. So it's not lost on me. And that's part of what we're going to talk about today is how do we get people's attention beyond the fact that it's been rated the number one diet by U.S. News and World Report for six years. Like, how do we get people to really pay attention? Right. And I think a big part of that is this gradual changes to incorporate into their diet and lifestyle that you do. Yes. We can talk about we have a big step by step guide that we put out that we really is one of our most popular downloads. And so I think it's really helping people understand that it's these small changes that add up to large health benefits over time. And if we can get you changing one thing, you know, that's what I do. You know, I have a lot of clients that don't eat vegetables, right? I mean, we do that. In our world, we're like, what? And you're like, yes, (laughs) most people are not doing it. And when you see how satisfying and really how successful you can be when you introduce them to it, you know, part of this diet and we can get into is that, you know, we use fat. We like using olive oil. And guess what? It has so many different purposes in our body, as we know, as you and I know. But guess what? It makes food taste great. Mm -hmm. And that is part of the key here for us at the Mediterranean diet. Yes. So I want to dive into some of those misconceptions, uh, especially the fat. Sure. But I I do want to mention, too, you had talked about all of these other Mediterranean countries that we don't hear much about. I do have a somewhat related episode, number 231, Carbohydrate Food Scores and Culturally Diverse Diets, where Dr. Judy Rodriguez talks about these other countries. And so I think it's becoming more, uh, we're, we're increasing awareness that it's not just Italy and Greece. And- exactly. And that's so important because, you know, when I say I like to meet people where they are, because listen, I live in one of the most diverse cities. It's culturally diverse. So you have to understand that this is this eating pattern. All of these guidelines are, I love that episode, aspirational instruments, right? Yeah, that's what we referred to. Really meet people where they are and what we're working towards. So whatever country or whatever, you take that eating pattern and then you translate it into their lives where they are. And it can really, really be done because when we get into the nitty gritty, you know, you have to look at what is the main goal. 
that we're trying to do here. And it's really getting people to ha- be primarily plant-based. So how do we change that culturally for them and their diets? But yeah, no, it's wonderful. So you don't want to forget about those 21 countries, right? Right. Cultural diversity. Yes. And a lot of times, some of their favorite cultural foods fit very well already. And they don't know that. Exactly. So you're reassuring them you can keep these cultural foods in your diet. And if they don't fit as well, there are ways to maybe include other foods yes. to increase variety and, and nutrient density and so on. Absolutely. That's exactly what we do. Okay, so let's talk about some of those misconceptions more in depth. Maybe let's start with the fat, uh, because that's a big one. Let's talk about fat, because uh, we get a lot of questions. So is fat going to make me fat, right? Am I going to gain weight? Clients are concerned about two things, really, when we see this, that A, wait a second, I have heart disease and you're asking, aren't I supposed to be on a low fat or a fat free diet? Mm -hmm. And then it's also associated people are concerned about gaining weight because they do know that fat has more calories. And so what you want to understand is the Mediterranean diet is a higher fat diet. It's typically about 30 to 35 percent of our total calories. And most recommendations are lower than that, maybe in the 20 to 25 percent. But what we focus on is using the right type of fat. So we all need those healthy fats in our diet. But we want you to use those unsaturated fats versus the saturated fats. So think olive oil and stelled it butter. You know, then we're also going to include those fatty fish, nuts, avocados. And on the Mediterranean diet, we primarily use monounsaturated fats. That's, you know, olive oil is kind of king to us. So we love olive oil, avocado oil. You know, it's reducing our cholesterol, reducing that LDL. So when people are concerned about gaining weight, you know, the research has actually found that adding a little more fat in our diets helps with satiety. It helps keep you fuller longer. So you're eating less. And then when we think about the role of fat in our diet, it takes longer to digest. It helps with that satiety and that feeling of fullness. And this is where I think the culinary part comes in. And our diet, it makes food taste great. This is really important because people want to eat food that taste great. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's nothing better than teaching somebody or helping someone put a little olive oil in the pan. You're using some zucchini or fresh squash and you're sauteing it till it gets this beautiful, crispy brown on one side. And then we're going to maybe throw a little Parmesan in there. And then we're going to add some basil and voila, you have this tasty side dish that's super simple. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, helping them understand the use of fat and then the use of vegetables. And then when we talk about why are we so much higher in fat? Because people are confused by that. When we look at the pre-meds heart study, it's a primary prevention trial, and it included thousands of people with diabetes and other risk factors for heart disease. And they found that a Mediterranean diet, you know, that had the olive oil or nuts, really reduced the rates of deaths from stroke by roughly 30%. So we were having this higher fat diet, and it's still reducing your rate of heart disease. So again, it it is hard for people to understand that, but more and more the research is showing that it is possible and it does help prevent heart disease. We knew that early on, but the research is continuing. So we have multiple studies for that factor. Okay. And as you're talking, so the Mediterranean diet is higher in fat than a lot of other diets. Yes. But it's probably not higher in fat than the average American is eating. So I'm guessing it's shifting from those saturated fats to the mono and the polyunsaturated fats. Right. So it's all about the type of fat, right? It's using those unsaturated fats. That's exactly it. So we really focus there for people. And that's a big shift. You know, that is really a big shift. But that can also reassure people like not telling you to eat more fat than you currently are necessarily with the different type. Absolutely. Okay, great. I also hear a lot uh, that people think that beef cannot be part of the Mediterranean diet. So I would love for you to address that. Yes. So that is a biggie. So we hear a lot about that. They, you know, that's usually one of the first questions that people ask. And really, people will say really more in the context of it's vegetarian. And no, what's so wonderful about the Mediterranean diet that all foods are included. And it's primarily plant-based, remember, but not exclusively So meats are still consumed, but in leaner and smaller portions. And so we really want you to change the way you think about meat. And so beef falls into this category, right? So we want you to use smaller amounts of beef, eat less often, save for special occasions. This is the biggest difference between the American diet 
and the Mediterranean diet, that plants are at the center of our plate, right? Mm -hmm. But again, uh, you know, I grew up in Texas. Here I am. I love red meat. I was a family. We bought it by the half cow, right? We bought our beef. And so, you know, there is still room for beef in your diet, just using it and just changing the way you think about it and using it in smaller amounts. Okay. What other misconceptions uh, should we dig into? I think one that's really important right now is that it's expensive. And I understand that. You know, we're all very concerned about our grocery bills. Lunchflation is real. We did a whole topic on this. You know, it is hard for people, you know, if you want to eat healthy, it can feel expensive, especially when we're asking you to maybe have fatty fish and seafood. Those things appear to be expensive. And so what we typically recommend doing is we always, so we are all about seasonal foods. So purchasing fresh fruits and vegetables in season. It's always the best, most economical way to go. But what that means is you have to know what's in season, right? Mm -hmm. What are the seasonal fruits and vegetables? And we post that all the time on all of our social channels. Then we always recommend keeping frozen or canned fruits and vegetables because now we know they're picked right out of the field at the peak of ripeness. They're flash frozen or canned. So also we recommend using frozen or canned fish and seafood. Mm. Those are great choices. Always have frozen fish or canned tuna or canned salmon in my pantry. Mm -hmm. And then going back to canned foods, we know one of our favorite canned foods are canned beans. Yay. Yes, we love them. I mean, they're so economical. You can buy low sodium varieties. And you know, it's a great way to add that plant-based protein and fiber and use less meat. We have a whole blog post on this on our uh, website that you can check out for additional tips. Okay, great. I think there's one other misconception, though, that I want to clear up. And I think it's such an important one because I think people don't realize, and it's the, really the whole idea of, I drink red wine, so mm. I follow the Mediterranean diet. I think that is so important because what we know from the research is you have to incorporate all the components of this eating pattern to reap the health benefits. You can't just cherry pick what you'd like to do. You can't just drink the red wine or eat the salmon. Mm -hmm. You have to exercise. You have the physical activity and the mindfulness. So it's all of those pillars working together. And I think just like we were talking about it, so many people want the magic bullet or one thing that they know that's going to work. And really, once again, it's all these wonderful components working together that help prevent disease. Mm -hmm. I think that is a big point. Yeah. And if somebody is eating salmon and drinking red wine, hey, they can check those two off. They're currently doing that. We're meeting them where they yes. are. Yes. What's the next thing to add and, and so on? Exactly. So what's the next small thing? Mm -hmm. And then I think the other misconception that really comes up a lot is I don't like Mediterranean food. So I really don't think I'm going to try this. Hmm. And I think people don't realize is that you do not have to eat just Mediterranean foods, Greek food, whatever food. All cuisines can fit into this pattern of just not the Greek foods. Remember, there's over 20 countries. And again, we meet you where you are. So we want to help you with this eating pattern. And so what we like to do at Fully Mediterranean is we have a little technique. We say we like to make it Mediterranean. So we're taking traditional recipes and giving them this wonderful Mediterranean twist to amp up their health benefits, make them more nutrient rich. So we always try and focus with our clients. What do I need to add to my diet? I think that's incredibly important. Right. And it can be as simple as adding fruits or vegetables to each meal. Mm -hmm. um, veggies to your greens, greens to your pasta. We love to show a graphic where you have a cheeseburger. So we know it's high in saturated fats, low in fiber and low in veggies. And then we're going to put a little arrow and we're going to say, let's make a nourish blended burger. So then we've taken some lean red meat. But we're going to add some legumes, maybe some black beans to it, some veggies. And then we're going to serve it with a side salad so that really you're getting more of that fiber and those antioxidants and all those good things that we need. Another thing that we really work on with clients, and part of this is making more of your meals meatless, right? And I think this is hard for people to do as well, especially if you're used to eating a lot of protein in your diet, meat and stuff. And so we like to make your favorite meals meatless. And being from Houston and Texas, we eat a lot of Mexican food, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe it's just changing up the beef for black beans, or maybe in your enchilada, it's trying spinach, things like that. 
or even just other simple ideas include like, you know, whether you're for stir fry using tofu or edamame, you know, really getting people used to trying some different things. So you don't have to just have Mediterranean foods. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously you don't want to necessarily decrease your protein intake overall. It's sort of like the fat conversation we had. You want to swap out for some other sources of protein because you you definitely don't want to be too low in protein. No. And we want to use those plant-based proteins. Mm -hmm. That's what we love to do. Great. I want to get more into some of the culinary aspects and how you work with people. You've touched on that a little bit in the fun enjoyment aspect. But before we do that, I would love to hear more about research on the Mediterranean diet, uh, about why it's so effective in disease prevention and risk reduction and what you would like people to know, but also addressing some recent news about the MIND diet not being as effective as we thought it might be and explaining what that MIND diet is and the recent news about the randomized control trial study. Right. No, that sounds great because there's a lot of research, obviously, on this topic. And You know, I think it goes back to when we were talking about a little bit of a deeper dive into the Mediterranean diet and talk about those foods. So, you know, when we talk about that, it's primarily plant-based. So it incorporates the basics of healthy, right? Fruits, vegetables, all those wonderful protective foods, right? Whole grains, legumes. These are protecting us from inflammation with the vitamins and minerals and antioxidants. Again, it's all about quality food components. Um, We talked already about that it's the biggest difference between the American diet and the Mediterranean diet, that these plant foods are at the core of your plate, the center of your plate. I like to say it's the original, it's the OG of anti-inflammatory diets. And all foods are included. It's not restricted. So we want to pay attention to what you're choosing and the amount. So when we think about it being an anti-inflammatory diet, It's this eating pattern that promotes fighting inflammation in our bodies. And we know that it's the chronic inflammation that occurs slowly over time in response to this long-term exposure to stress. So that's poor diet, which is, you know, the refined processed foods, too much sugar, an excess of refined carbohydrates, excessive alcohol, unhealthy fats, all those things. And when we see this chronic inflammation within the body, it can cause chronic diseases such as cancer and diabetes, heart disease, and then cognitive decline. So we really think, you know, from the research, the Mediterranean diet, it fights inflammation because it emphasizes these plant-based foods, right? And it's that fiber, that wonderful fiber that we're getting, the antioxidants, all those healthy fats, the monounsaturated fats, and then we get into with our fatty fish and salmon, the omega-3s, they help fight inflammation. And then, of course, you're eating less processed food if you're following this trend. But again, it's the synergistic effect that we see that the research shows us that is really what is reducing inflammation in our body. It's the sum of all those parts. And so all these components that we just talked about are associated with helping improve risk factors for all these different diseases. And so we have specific research that shows for each state that high fiber plants are helping improve our blood sugar control. The healthy fats are helping prevent heart disease. I kind of mentioned earlier the original studies that this whole diet was founded on was by Ansel Keys, the seven country studies. And it was really groundbreaking because it showed there was this diet, heart health relationship. And then it was that this way of eating really reduced your risk factors for heart disease. So that was hypertension, obesity, you know, an increased LDL. When we talk about diabetes, and I know, you know, you're a certified diabetic educator, we have the cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes show some of the same risk factors, right? Mm -hmm. So obesity, high triglycerides, that low HDL. So We know studies in the Mediterranean, it's beneficial for preventing and the management of type 2 diabetes. And one of the studies showed, you know, it's improving your risk factors for those triglycerides, the body weight, your A1C. Then other studies have shown that it helps with insulin resistance, losing that weight. So for heart disease, we know it helps. We have the research for diabetes. And then Really, cancer is our next thing that we really see a lot of, a significant amount of 
research on them because it's that protective effect, you know. It's the high intake of those fruits and vegetables, whole grains. Again, I like to call them their protective foods Mm -hmm. that's reducing inflammation. And we know that reduces your risk of overall cancer deaths. But when we see in studies, if you have a higher adherence to the Mediterranean diet, that's when we get into the really preventing colorectal cancer, breast cancer, liver, pancreatic, and prostate cancers. There was a big review in 2021 that showed that it lowered the risk for all cancer deaths. So there's always amazing research out there. I think it's constantly changing. Sometimes you're like, oh my gosh, there's another one and another one. Mm -hmm. So in response to this new MIND diet study that just came out this summer, really all the studies in the past about the MIND diet, which stands for, it's a combination of the Mediterranean and the DASH diets, Um, So the Mediterranean DASH diet intervention for neurodegenerative delay, and that's what they call the MIND diet. And it's a diet designed specifically to boost the brain. So in the past, it's really been all observational studies. And so now we finally have this randomized clinical trial that happened over the last three years. And so their expectations were very high that they would see that the group following the MIND diet would, you know, show significant improvements in their brain function, right, through their MRI scans. And actually, that didn't happen. Really, the control group and the mind diet group really actually showed the same results. So people were really surprised by this, I think. And so to me, I think you have to look at a couple of things, I think, when we're looking at this. First of all, what was the length of the study? And I think this is where people are thinking, okay, most of our studies have been over multiple years, really longer durations. So it's too short of a time to impact a disease that take decades to develop. So that's first thing about this study. Secondly, I think uh, researchers know it can be difficult to do a clinical trial on nutrition Mm -hmm. because people may realize what arm of the study that they're in, right? So we know the control group also lost weight, right? And so they had some slight improvements also in their MRI scans and in their brain function. So they may have improved their own diet, right? So, you know, a lot of people feel clearly they were changing their diets. But I think the good news that's happening here is that the bottom line is that I think we found out that a healthy diet, not just the mind diet, really does improve cognitive function. So it's not just one, you have to do this, right? And I think that's encouraging for people. And then also, you have to remember, I think, part of our world that solid science is not based on one single study. Mm -hmm. So we have to take it all into comparison. But again, you know, I think it's super interesting, but I don't think it's like, oh, we're going to throw out the mind diet. I think we just, A, it calls for further research. But wow, that is good news, though. Both groups improve their cognitive function, and they did lose weight over those three years. So all good things. Okay. Thank you for that. I appreciate your recap on that. So I had said earlier, I would love to hear more about how you bring the culinary aspect into your education and your programs and why that's so important, the fun factor, I'm guessing, and and maybe even sharing some client success stories. So yay, this is the fun part for me. I love it. So I'm definitely a practitioner. You know, this is what I do day in and day out. And so You may not think cooking and fun go together, but by the time we're through with you, we're going to make it a pleasurable experience in the kitchen. Excellent. And, you know, our whole goal is to get people back to eating at the table and remembering that this is difficult for people, that this is a hard journey. You know, food is personal. You've had these habits for a long time, so we're going to help you change them. But by goodness, we're going to have fun doing it. So, Health starts in the kitchen. There's so many wonderful benefits to teaching people to cook. We know from the research when you cook at home, you eat healthier. It helps with when you're cooking, you get to choose your own ingredients. You can choose more variety. So this helps ultimately in that disease prevention that we're talking about. And then also one of our goals is to get people back to eating at the table. There's so many benefits surrounding eating at the table. When we talk about it, we know from the research Sharing meals together, it encourages better relationships. There's less stress. We know, we just talked about, you make healthier choices when you're eating at the table together. You live longer. 
If you have children at home, family meals are even more important because research shows that family meals can reduce depression, promote healthy eating, and improve self-esteem. So super important. So we incorporate this into our curriculum in all different ways. So I do private cooking with people. I do reels. We do recipe demos and videos. So the whole goal is to make people feel comfortable in the kitchen so that they can accomplish their goals of eating healthier. And, you know, I think one of the most important things we show them is that it doesn't have to be complicated to taste good or to be healthy. Amen. Listen, I get people don't have time to cook and they don't necessarily always like to cook. Mm -hmm. And that's super important to help them with it. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite, when we talk about success stories, I have two and they're kind of totally opposite. But one of them is about We call him the West Texas carnivore because he was a guy from West Texas that had a very strong history of heart disease and his lipids were way out of balance. And as he likes to say, he was staring down the path of becoming a vegan from his doctor. Mm. And so like you always say, that is totally out of question for someone like me, a West Texas carnivore who loved his red meat, right? That was what he was about. And so I worked with him for nine months. And he did not need to lose weight, but he showed incredible sleep improvements, dramatically enhanced all of his scores. And his doctor said it was the single fastest improvement he has ever seen. He was like the perfect student, right? He Mm -hmm. really was so conscientious about it because he had such a significant history in his family. And I think the other thing that really struck me was his own words, whereas he really is enjoying his new relationship with fish, which he really didn't enjoy, Mm -hmm. fruits and vegetables, along with less red meat. So Mm -hmm. he really did. But, you know, it took nine months, right? You know, it takes a while to get there. So that is such a great story because I think it really shows you that even though you've enjoyed meat your whole life and you still can enjoy it, step by step, we can help you translate this pattern into your own eating and into your own kitchen and your own lives. That's excellent. And the other example, you know, may not seem as dramatic as this, but it really is in just a more subtle way because I had this client that really needed to make some behavior change and really make some changes in their diets and full-time work, kids, the whole kit and caboodle, really difficult, right? And she didn't like to cook. And I think it was so rewarding for me to see at the end of the day, you know, she really dreaded it, right? Coming home and answering that question, it was really hard. And I think at the end of our program, she was like, I look forward to it now. Mm. I come home, I turn on my music, I relax, Mm. and then I cook and I know what I'm doing and I can nurture my family. I can, and that's what it's about, right? And then I love, she would always send me pictures of what she was cooking. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the ultimate compliment to me is Mm -hmm. when my clients and people that know and love me send me pictures of their food. And I'm thinking about you. And that's cute. So I love that, you know, and that's what it was for her. It was really so amazing to see that change and her feel so good about it. Yeah, quality of life. Yeah, I love that. Totally. I've shared this a little bit on the podcast before, but I've evolved my own kitchen confidence uh, mm-hmm. over the past eight years or so that I've been doing the podcast and in particular my Do More With Dinner initiative. Mm-hmm. I didn't dread cooking, but mm-hmm. I was busy. I just wanted something quick and easy. And right now I, I am at that point where I look forward to it and it's almost like I'm done working. I'm going to the kitchen And I'm having fun. So I I think that's really, really great. Yes, I love that. I've enjoyed that. And so has my family. They've benefited from it. (laughs) That's it. That is. Yes, we love that. So I know that you have this program that is step by step. But if you could just share a few simple steps that people could take to kind of get started on this Mediterranean diet slash lifestyle journey. Yeah. And what that might look like. Okay, so we have the guide. Please go download it. It's free on our website. But I think there's three things that you can really do. And I think the first thing you should do is choose olive oil, right? Just start cooking with olive oil, really changing that. Looking at what type of fats you're using at home. You know, if you're buying salad dressing, what oil are they using? Looking at your labels and seeing what type of fat is in those products. I think that's key. So choose olive oil. Secondly, I'd say check your plate. 
You can do it at any time, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. What does your plate look like? So if we want those plant-based foods to be at the center of your plate, are they? So that's fruits, that's really those vegetables, those whole grains and beans. What is crowding your plate? And so that's what we want. And listen, I want half of it to be vegetables, Mm -hmm. really and truly. Those dark green leafies, eat the rainbow. I think this is something um, is so important. So check your plate. And again, I love that because it's whether it's a bowl in the morning, whether it's lunch or dinner, anyone, anywhere can do that. And then thirdly, change the way you think about meat. Really start looking at how much meat am I really eating? Chicken, turkey, red meat. What does that look like? You know, obviously, we'd like you to incorporate more fish and seafood in your diet at least twice a week. And I say at least, but again, so maybe using meat as a garnish, using it just in those stir fries, using it for flavoring. That's such a wonderful way to start. So changing the way you think about meat and incorporating those meatless meals. That's really, really thinking about, can I make my favorite foods meatless? Can I do that? Of course you can. I mean, tacos are the simple way to start, you know, lasagna, right? I mean, so some of those things. Okay, thank you. And as we're wrapping up, I know know, we've got a lot of resources that we're going to touch on. You know, we've got these simple steps to kind of get started. But what would you say the bottom line takeaway is for our listeners? Okay, so the first thing would be that the Mediterranean diet is a lifestyle. So it includes nutrition, movement, and enjoying meals with others. So focus on the foods that you need to incorporate into your diet. Remember those primarily that plant-based foods, but not exclusively. And I think for healthcare practitioners, and I really think for dietitians, this is what most clients need help on. Really identifying, well, what does that really mean? Mm -hmm. What does that look like for me on my plate at home? And so I think that's one of the most important things that you can work on. Um, Secondly, remember to reap the health benefits of the Mediterranean diet lifestyle. You have to incorporate all the components. You can't just cherry pick what you like. Yes, it's wonderful. You might be eating salmon and some of those things, but keep going. Keep checking off your list. Keep working on it because it's that synergistic effect that really prevents disease in our body. And then finally, I think it's so important to understand is that with the Mediterranean diet, you can enjoy food and prevent disease. Good food and good health go together. All right. Thank you. So where can people find more about this topic and connect with you? Websites, social media handles, anything specific uh, in the way of resources that you'd like to share? Sure. You can follow us all over the place. You can find us at Instagram at, at Fully Mediterranean, on Facebook at Fully Mediterranean, our website. We have, like I was saying on the website, it's a pop-up. Our step-by-step guide is always available. And then we've just introduced this wonderful, well, it was not introduced. It's been going for two years. We have a Mediterranean diet course. So just think just like Netflix so that people can join. We also offer it not only privately to people, but we work with uh, physicians and corporate clients to offer it as well. Okay, great. And I'll have all those links, of course, in my show notes at soundbitesrd.com. Yes. And I also wanted to give a shout out to our colleagues who have some Mediterranean cookbooks out there. Uh, Serena Ball and Deanna Seagrave Daly, two friends of mine. Right. They authored the 30-minute Mediterranean diet cookbook and also the Sustainable Mediterranean Diet Cookbook. And they have a new one coming out called the Smart Mediterranean Diet Cookbook, which is really uh, focused on the, you know, what's good for the heart is good for the brain. So it's really focused on brain health and the research there. So stay tuned for more information on that on the podcast, but I will put links to those books in the show notes as well. And I'm sure you can find those on Amazon as well. Wonderful. Yeah, they are great. They have great cookbooks. Yeah. Make it tasty. You got to make it tasty. They do. That's the key. That's right. It's delicious. Yes. Are you working on anything else right now that you'd like to share with us? Um, Really just our course. So it's our course that we're really working on that we've been doing, like I said, for the past two years. And so I think it's really exciting because, you know, people are busy. And so it's really based on my private practice. And so you just sign up and it's like I said, Netflix, you just download it and you start watching. And then we have office hours that you can 
hop into with me and one of our team of dietitians. And then we have group cooking classes. And so it's really fun. And it's a great way for people that are super busy to um, really learn all about the Mediterranean diet. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on the show and talking all things Mediterranean diet lifestyle. Well, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. I could always keep going and going. There's just so much um, you can talk about. So thank you for having me. Well, thank you for the work that you do. And for everybody listening, as always, enjoy your food with health in mind. Till next time. For more information, visit soundbitesrd.com. This podcast does not provide medical advice. It is for informational purposes only. Please see a registered dietitian for individualized advice. Music by Dave Burke, produced by JAG and Detroit Podcasts. Copyright Soundbites Inc., all rights reserved.